Welcome to MSL Talk with Tom Caravella, a podcast specifically designed for MSLs and all things field medical. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Bruno Larvel. He is the founder and CEO of Larvel. And we talk about how MSLs can win on social media in medical affairs. Uh, great conversation. Bruno's the best. Hope you guys enjoy this. Don't forget to connect and follow me on LinkedIn and social media. Um, also, check us out on YouTube. We have our videos up there. And uh, lastly, join us for MSL Talk Live, which is the first Tuesday of every month at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Hey, Bruno. Welcome to the podcast again. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Tom. So excited to have you back. It's uh, This is kind of part two because we, we met not that long ago. It was a great conversation. This one is going to be even better. I'm really excited about this chat. So, But before we get into it, love to have you introduce yourself and uh, tell everybody who you are and where you're from and all sure, that good sure. stuff. And, and I actually want to say bonjour because yeah. I'm from France originally, and I know your podcast is listened everywhere in the world, including many countries that speak French, plus uh, France is going to the, the final, so that's exciting for the World Cup. Um, I'm the co-founder of Larvel, which is a, a SaaS company uh, headquartered in San Francisco, but as we heard last time, all of our business is done actually in virtual reality, in the metaverse. We are selling software solutions and data solutions to the pharma, the healthcare industry, and in particular, the medical affair community. So we love the community that you're serving with your podcast and also with your recruitment business. And uh, we, we're delighted to be here today. Yeah, awesome. And guys, Bruno came up with this topic, which I think is a really important one. I think it's a relevant one. I think it's going to help a lot of folks out there, not just MSLs. I think this is one of those topics that's going to help a lot of people, anybody that might be listening. Um, couple couple things I want to get out of the way before we get started. For those of you listening right now, you can't see us. Um, I came prepared with my purple larval hat. So I actually showed up to work today with my purple larval hat. If you guys aren't familiar with the company, the brand really stands out because Bruno's colors are purple. Um, I also, and I mentioned this on our last podcast, I have a pair of purple larval socks that I picked up at a, at a conference. I went to where, find them. My daughter stole them. So I have the purple hat minus the purple socks, but I am all ready to go. And I think that's important because um, Larval is, is, is a sponsor of ours. They're actually sponsoring this episode today. And if you guys aren't familiar with them, they were established in 2004 um, and they combine the best of both artificial and human intelligence to deliver expertly curated and personalized data solutions to medical affairs, competitive intelligence, commercial, um, and R&D teams within the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. So for more details on Larval, check them out on Larval.com. And Bruno is a, someone that I highly, highly regard. I've known him for a long time, and I'm excited to talk to him about Social media. So, Bruno, where do we start? I mean, you know, are MSL supposed to be on social media? Like, let's start there. Well, it, it it's an interesting topic because it's a bit of a controversial yes topic. Um, so, I, I'm not an MSL. So, everything I know from the MSL world comes from my customers. So, uh, at the same time, I've got maybe the benefit of being a little bit outside looking in, mm -hmm. and also, um, but but I'm not in the trenches or being an MSL. So what I, I want to say that as a caveat to my, my commentaries today. Also, we are uh, developing and we are selling uh, solutions having to do with social listening in particular, not engagement. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so interesting about the uh, topic of social media for me in medical affairs is how uh, the, 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 the challenges between listening and engaging. Mm -hmm. And my, my, my best guess from all the interactions I have is that the industry is still very, very nervous mm. about engaging. The compliance department, the legal department are wor worrying that if you engage as an MSL with KOL, the compliance sort of uh, guards that exist in your normal engagement are, are, are probably too porous. There's some challenges there that inadvertently you could actually uh, create a liability. 
Right. And so uh, my, my general sense is that the stage we're in between the medical affair world and social media, and then we can talk more broadly about social media, by the way, outside of medical affairs, is that right now is the age of listening, of monitoring, and the engagement probably should be limited to, I would even argue, just liking, not even reposting, not even reposting what Dr. Smith just tweeted about that trial. Um, there's probably even some compliance department out there, Tom, that they don't even like. Yeah. If, if it's a KOL you track and you're an MSL, don't even like, don't even engage. You can engage using maybe direct messages or, of course, uh, perhaps, but do not even like them. I, If I were an MSL, I would argue to my manager, we can like. Liking is not a level of engagement that is problematic. But as soon as you start engaging beyond liking, I, I do expect uh, people to get very nervous in uh, the, the compliance department of pharma. So I think most of the action today is in listening, actively listening. listening. So what you're saying is, so for example, you follow... Uh, your KOLs on social media, let's say it's Twitter, um, LinkedIn, you follow their posts, see what they're posting, and you're just reading. You're in the background and you're just picking up whatever it is that they're putting down and putting out there to learn and gain insights about what their interests are. Is that what you're saying? It, it, exactly. And you mentioned the two platforms that matter the most, of course, Twitter and LinkedIn. Of course, some um, some KOL are starting to be active on on Instagram on on Reels in particular and yeah. TikTok even sometimes. Yeah. But it's it's harder to, and there's not enough people but to to really have a, a, a ton of activity. But um, if I were hiring um, MSLs right now, I would say you have to be actively listening to your KOLs on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and then if you want to engage with them. You can use the traditional channels, but at least you know what's going on with Dr. Smith and uh, and so on and so forth. So active listening, I believe, is where the 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 activity, the action, the opportunities are. But I will I will add one thing to it, which is that um, I believe you cannot not listen. Yeah, I would argue that in MSL you have um, even today it's nearly expected for for true KOL. I mean. Uh, uh, the definition of KOL in our industry has evolved and diluted a little bit. Uh, it, right, a lot of H HCP has followed. They're not really KOL. They're not that active. But for for people who are really, especially uh, emerging KOL, rising stars, uh, I believe that increasingly, if I'm a physician, if I'm a KOL, a rising star, a young Turk, so to speak, um, I have to be active in social media. Some of my friends, the 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 institutions. Um, in oncology in particular, or the journal they're publishing on are saying, how active are you in social media? If you're not active, you're not going to have the impact and the visibility and supporting the publication you just did. So I think that the, the most important part of the KOL community is going to be active and that as an MSL, uh, there's a need to listen to them, I would argue. Yep. Okay, I got a couple of questions here. I'm I'm going to kind of go in a, one specific order, but I'm going to get back to this idea of, of, of listening. So you have these KOLs that are out and they're active on social media. Does those that are very active, does that make them a DOL? Do they now become a digital wow. opinion leader? Uh, that's a great question. They are, they, they are, uh, some people call that the Kardashian ratio, which is a ratio between the number of followers and the number of publications. And there are some wonderful uh, oncologists, again, that's the main area I'm focusing on, that are wonderful, loved by everybody. They are very influential in some ways, but nearly more socially than academically. And they don't have a lot of publications, for example. They don't even maybe do clinical trials. Uh, in oncology, um, Dr. Don Dyson, Dr. Mark Lewis, who I, I know I'm friends with both of them, they're wonderful people. They're not very active academically. Their influence is nearly more, more social in some ways. I would not consider them the traditional definition of a digital opinion leaders from okay. a influence or practice standpoint. And so the, uh, just looking at the number of followers and being an oncologist, let's say, is not enough. 
to be a DOL, to be a digital opinion leader. Got you. All right. So, so these, so these folks exist out there. And and if you're an MSL and you're not listening and you're not paying attention, you really could be missing missing out on some key messaging. So let's just say you're doing that, right? So you're you're an MSL and you're listening on these platforms. What do you do next? Well, um, of course, uh, the, the goal of an MSL, to a degree, is is engagement within the compliance constraint of uh, of your uh, set by by your by your enterprise to engage you need to have a, an anchor for engagement a reason to engage a context for that engagement so knowing where dr smith uh, is where dr smith is going to be next maybe at a big conference or maybe at a small uh, webinar at a small symposium as a grand at a grand round so all of these mini engagement opportunities where um, there could be an opportunity for you to uh, to to uh, see if uh, Dr. Smith needs any help or to to otherwise engage with Dr. Smith or follow Dr. Smith's activity in that in that um, situation. So knowing these events is not easy. It's actually not easy. So you have two ways to know that, or actually three ways. The third one is a bit self-serving. <laughs> but one way is to follow Dr. Smith on Twitter and on LinkedIn, and hopefully. Dr. Smith will announce where I will be doing a symposia at University of XYZ on, um, on, 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 in January. The second way is to Google Dr. Smith. MSL don't have time to Google Dr. Smith and, and every other KOL every week. The third, that's the infomercial part maybe, <laughs> is to high level. <laughs> because we have a team of people whose job it is to search on Google every week where is Dr. Smith and <laughs> what is she doing, right? And so to tell you then, okay, Dr. Smith will have a webinar that day, will have a symposium that day, will be on the uh, uh, on Tom's podcast that other day, et cetera. Yeah. So you have to, listen, basically you have to follow along and see what's going on, gain insights, use that as a strategy for engagement. And and to anchor your engagements or icebreakers or just being um, in the know, because if you're not listening, if you're not on social media, um, you, you may not be able to uncover or really identify um, all of or some of or most of what this KOL um, is interested in and what's going on, what's relevant. Is that what you're saying? Uh, y y yes, there's not just uh, engagement situation. There's also what interests at KOL. Right. The question they have, the debate, uh, or sometimes the conflicts of opinion that, or, or of person, sometimes, as you know, that they engage in. And if I were, I love to speculate about things I'm not doing. If I were K uh, an MSL, what I would do is actually not use what I know about that KOL as a nice breaker, because that's kind of a little bit, um, it's a little bit um, uh, too calculated in some ways. Right. What I will do is that I will talk to Dr. Smith and I will know what happened. And then naturally in the conversation, Dr. Smith will even understand that I know that. And then I would really, I think, impress or even what I avoid saying or what I, the, 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 I will know certain things that would make the conversation much more rich and much more um, um, context-driven, so to mm -hmm. speak, uh, for Dr. Smith. And then maybe it will come in the conversation that I know what I learned in social media uh, about Dr. Smith, or maybe it will not come. And in both cases, I think my relationship with Dr. Smith, my ability to, uh, within the compliance guideline, help Dr. Smith will be, will be higher. Uh, I have to stop talking about Dr. Smith because... Uh, uh, imagine being named Dr. Smith and be a KOL. You think everybody's talking about you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's switch gears for a second. So we're talking about listening and how you can educate yourself, um, be a part of the conversation without being a part of the conversation, know and am arm yourself with information for engagement, however you decide to use it. But what about MSLs posting, creating a brand on whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter um, professionally. So now 
you're an MSL and you have these social media outlets available to you. Um, and that's an opportunity for personal, for, for professional branding. So what should MSLs be doing actively on social platforms? Uh, I, I wasn't thinking about that angle, Tom, and uh, now I am. If I were an MSL, I will do exactly that. I will come to your show, but also I will try to build my presence in the industry without, but, but while being careful that, of course, the compliance people are okay with, uh, with me. And I think that as long as I don't engage with KOLs and I talk broadly about topics relevant to my field, my industry, um, or in general trends in the field and engage with my peers, uh, I, I'm quite certain there is absolutely a compliant way to do this. And the beauty of it is that for me to, number one, uh, uh, create a presence that would lead for more um, employment opportunities, number mm -hmm. one, sharing best practices with my colleagues, feeling that you're part of an industry or a sub-industry, the medical affairs, I think this is wonderful. I really recommend people who are current MSL or maybe aspiring MSL to build their profile, to engage that way. Again, maybe not with KOL too directly, but with each other, uh, with with influencers like yourself in some ways in, in the field. Uh, I when, when I hire people for my company, and, and sometimes I say that it's a little controversial perhaps, uh, if they're not engaged socially in social media, on Twitter and on LinkedIn, uh, that's, a, that's a problem for me because I know that in five, 10, 20 years, uh, the conversation, the engagement in our field, in our professional activity is gonna be more shared, more open, more social media driven, whether it's podcast, whether it's TikTok, whether it's Twitter type. Uh, so I, I think that all of us as professionals, we owe it to ourselves. Even, even someone who doesn't have necessarily, you know, a, a big profile yet to engage. Uh, professionally and what what I tell people and that's also a little bit of a sometimes tough position is that I feel it's too difficult to decouple the personal and the professional in other words um, of course on Twitter and on LinkedIn you might especially on Twitter you might post you know personal stuff as well and and um, in my view the future is accepting that we're still one person and it would not be fair to expect someone on Twitter to only tweet personal, only tweet professional, and that it's okay if we're more informal and more sort of unified as who we are between the personal sphere and the professional sphere. That's a bit my prediction about social media. That'll be my advice to maybe a younger me looking at uh, how to use social media in my, in my career. It's such a part of, of society and the professional world that we live in right now that if you if you don't have at least a decent presence on social media, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. So for example, on the recruiting side, the first thing that we do when we get a resume from somebody or we get a name from somebody is we go on LinkedIn and we check out their LinkedIn profile. We look at everything. We look at their photo. We look at their experience and their history and what their interests are. We look at their postings. We look to see if they've branded themselves in a certain way. If they're an expert, if they have expertise in a certain therapeutic area, you mentioned oncology. So you're an oncology MSL and you just went to ASH or ASCO. Well, you should be posting beforehand that you're heading to Asher Asco. You should be be taking photos so that you could post them during and after for yes. engagement purposes because everybody's seeing that. Your colleagues are seeing it. Your KOLs are seeing it. And that establishes you as an expert or at least someone who's in that space. So it's a great branding tool and if you don't utilize it, you're missing out on an opportunity. Is that kind of what you're saying uh, as well? And, and yes, and I understand how for some people who be a more private, more introvert socially or in with technology, it, it could come as an imposition on them, mm -hmm. um, right? I understand that. But with you, I would argue that it's a little bit like if you go to a conference, you work the room, you're social, you yeah. meet with people. And in, in all 
part of business, but in particular, um, medical affair. We, we cannot not be an extroverted professional. We can be introverted personally. That's everybody has a personality, but professionally, we have to, we have to, we have to reach out. And like you, I would argue that today, when you reach out to your colleague, to your field, to your, to your network, you cannot just do it meeting in person and at conferences. You have to uh, do it using the modern technology of today, which is, which is social media. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so accepted. It's so out there. It's ex it really is an expected thing. And I'll tell you, and there are getting back to the compliance issues that you do have to be careful. Um, there are a lot of MSLs that have been given the um, the OK to engage. So at, we had um, or I had Jason DeMuth on my podcast a while back. I forget which episode it was, but Jason was with the first person that mentioned how active he was on Twitter. And he did exactly what you're saying to do. He's, he used to listen, find his KOLs, and he used to listen and sit in the background and see what they were talking about, what they were posting, what kind of information was important to them. He actually talked about a situation where a KOL had asked a question or said that they were having a difficult time finding a certain study, finding certain information. And he jumped in and said, oh, hey, Dr. So-and-so, you know, here's a link to that information, which opened up a door for him. So that being a problem solver and being able to identify opportunities to help out or to show your expertise, I think is definitely another way to utilize these platforms, provided that your company allows you to do so. Like you said before, some companies don't allow you to engage. I think in this day and age, I think it's become more commonplace to engage depending on, I guess there's probably rules of engagement that each company has, so you have to follow that. But I think that there's so many practical applications for how and how you can use social media um, and how often, just depending on your situation. But I think it's a mistake if you don't allocate a certain amount of time each week, maybe not each day, but each week, I think you need to allocate a certain amount of time professionally to be active on social media. And by active, I mean, you might just be a listener and spend some time on there. Or if you are able to um, put some postings out there, show your expertise, show your brand and get yourself out there. So do you agree with that? I I, I agree. Uh I don't. I don't see how even legally a company could say you cannot be personally active in social media. Obviously, that would be that would not be possible. And uh, e even in terms of not um, advertising the fact that I'm working for, let's say AstraZeneca, I don't see how uh, a company would say you cannot. You you, you probably have to say my tweets are my own on right. I mean, my posting and right. my own opinion. I'm not representing any company. When I'm talking, but but sh saying that I'm at ASCO, who wants to meet, right? I, I don't see nothing non-compliant about that. That's right. That's right. Or even um, even social talk. If I say, "Hey, Doctor So So, wonderful that you'll be at ASCO. I'm looking forward to say hi." What part of that could be non-compliant? I'm not talking about product. Right. I'm not. I'm not talking about any data. I, it's a social interaction, and so. I, I, and it's very valuable. Uh, it, it's part of a human connection between people. MSLs are in the human business, not just in the data business. So, I I think it's uh, think the 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 uh, the the rules are going to continue to be defined. But I, I really like to encourage MSLs and and head of MSLs and and directors to try to push toward being being more progressive. And more and and more um, uh, accepting of engagement. Uh, also, uh, it makes things more fun. Yeah, right, for everybody. I mean, uh, you know, it 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 it's not it's not fun to sit at home and 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 wait for the phone call or call someone and uh, and uh, so when you engage in your industry, you contribute socially and with knowledge and with just branding and with sharing your excitement about going to that conference or meeting your colleague. You're part of an industry. It's more fun. And 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 that's what social media makes. It it gets us closer as a, as an industry. 
Absolutely. You know, you bring up, and that brings up the point of how you're developing your career. This isn't just what you're doing with inside your role as an MSL, but it's also what you're doing to develop your career because there's an, in, this investment into social media, let's say LinkedIn, for example, the more connections that you develop on LinkedIn, the more really good content that you put out there on LinkedIn, the more you build your brand, the better case you make for the future of your career. So for example, if you right now are a brand new MSL or you've been an MSL for a couple of years, or you're looking to become an MSL and you do a really good job in branding yourself, let's say in a certain therapeutic area, um, a certain expertise or whatever it might be, well, that's going to help solidify your chances of getting your next job or getting your promotion, whatever that might be. It's and you put it in a in a in a very positive way as you as you should. That would be my warm warm advice to 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 anybody uh, in in that career. Uh, project yourself out there, invest because also, um, I mean, you stay with a company what on average now, two years, three years, four years. Yeah. Okay, so you're not going to save that company all the time. If people don't know you, uh, it's going to be harder and harder each time you shift to find the right fit for you. And also, all the relationships that you build while working for a company, they belong to you. Right. They belong to you. Yeah, I know some of the data stays in the Viva, right? Customer yeah. Relationship Management Database. I understand. But everything else, all the relationship you have, with KOLs, you're, you're connected with them on LinkedIn. They, fo you, they follow you back, maybe, who knows, on Twitter. That's an asset you built during your three years in that company. Absolutely. Why not bring that asset with you, with a new company? Absolutely legal, absolutely ethical. It would be ethical, unethical not to allow that, actually. So I, I, I really think it's a wonderful habit to build. Well, and it's so funny. You should, I was just about to say, this absolutely is a habit. This is something that... I would recommend, don't just say, okay, once a month, I'm going to go on to LinkedIn and I'm going to do some research or I'm going to build up my network or I'm going to post a couple of things. Going into right now, I believe this episode is going to air in the very, very beginning of 2023. So now's the perfect time to say, I'm going to create a habit where every day I'm going to go on to LinkedIn for 15 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, or maybe it's you know, maybe it's an hour per week and it's 10 minutes a day, five days, whatever. Figure out a cadence and then get on there each day or each week and be active to build up your community and your brand by establishing a, a, a routine of sending out a certain number of invitations to people, sending out a certain number of posts, that sort of thing, because that's how you build it up over time. If you try to do it all in one sitting, you're not going to get the same bang out of it. That would be it's my like, advice. It's like saying, I'm going to wait until Friday evening to enter into Viva or any CRM. Right. All my my conversation during the week. It never happened. First, I right. forget. Second, it's not a habit. Right. So you're right. It, it, I even would argue that once a day is the right pace. And yeah. um. And you cannot do that unless you do it on your phone. I mean, I don't think so. I think the idea is that you do it on your phone. You're you're waiting uh, at the grocery line or in an elevator. Right? Check what's going on with uh, on Twitter or on on. Well, and there's a lot of non-business things happening that you're being interested in. It sends you notification about what's happening here and there. Yeah. So I think it has to be mobile to be an easy uh, uh, habit to do to do every day. And initially, it's hard because you don't know anybody. But then you have two or three friends, and it becomes fun. And after a while, it becomes a healthy, I would argue, addiction. And it takes no time because all of these little five minutes in your day, you reclaim they, them, right? It's not like you sit down to do the Twitter or to do the your your LinkedIn work. That would be work. But if you're in an elevator, well, you, of course, go look at your phone and check the tweets and check the, 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 the LinkedIn and get a notification, respond to this and... And and then and then it it fills in all of these little times in your day. Yeah. Oh, that's that's me. Yeah. That's, that's me. Cool. Um, uh, <laughs> I get yelled at. My wife yells at me. She's like, "Would you put your phone down?" <laughs> um, but you know, but but here's here's something I want to add to that. You know, it's 
in those short little stints when you're sitting there and you're in line at the checkout at the grocery store or whatever, and you're kind of like bored and you look at your phone, you're on LinkedIn or you're on Twitter or whatever, um, likes, comments, shares, that's engagement. That's oh, engagement. Yeah. That's a part of the whole thing. It takes two seconds. In uh, a lot of these algorithms, because ultimately, not to be dramatic, but we're already working for the algorithm. Yeah. The algorithm rewards us or not based on whether we follow the rules that they right. want us to follow. And the rule of the alg algorithm, that's the important thing to understand. The algorithm makes money by selling advertisement, yep. meaning by having engagement. And sometimes the negative of that is that the, alg the, the algorithm understood, very smart, the best way to get engagement is to get controversy, to get people to fight. So the algorithm makes us fight. Yeah, that sounds a scary thought. There's it's a little bit of that happening politically sometimes, right? Yeah, uh, it encourages controversy, negative engagement, even. Now, in our industry, it's mostly constructive, positive engagement, hopefully, right? Yeah. But but um, but if you just like someone's post or just say bravo or thumbs up, you help them. You help their profile. You validate their situation, you help them grow their profile. They have objectives in also growing their, their presence. It takes you nothing, right? You just, it's just a, a little, like a fraction of a second to type. Uh, and, and you help them, you connect with them. Uh, and so now you have connection with a lot of people. I might be talking for a few minutes, it's many, a few minutes a month with someone by a few likes, a few comments, but we're friends. Now, yep. it's not the same quality of friendship as someone I would have coffee with every week, obviously. Right. But it is remarkably meaningful at the human level. Absolutely. And, and that's incredible when you think about it, right? A few minutes you can have lighter, but still very meaningful engagement with a much, much broader uh, uh, group of people, thanks to technology. Yep. And if there's anyone out there listening to this and you're new and, and you're looking to build up connections or... You, you're if you're in the industry, send me a connection request. I guarantee I'll say yes. I'm not going to turn you away. <laughs> Same here. Actually, <laughs> earlier in my LinkedIn uh, career, I was um, was called a lion, uh, a LinkedIn open networker. Yeah. And the way that system works is that you advertise that you're a lion, a LinkedIn open networker, in your profile. And what that means is that anybody can reach out to you to ask to be connected, you don't need to say yes, but you never tag them as I don't know them. Because right. if you tag them and I don't know them, the algorithm might punish them right. for reaching it does. out. Yeah. And, and that way I build a, a network that I'm maxed on my network. So I'm at 30,000. And every six months I need to uh, remove people that I'm not engaging with to add more. Uh, so even if you're interested in more aggressively building your profile, you could designate yourself as a lion. And check it out. Read read the rules. Do it right. Yeah. But um, I, I think it's it's a it's okay to be to to be in a hurry to build a network. And there's so much value in it. No doubt. And one last thing for me, guys, I, I could tell you just be mindful of your image and your brand, and just make sure you know what you want. And what I mean by that is, I try to tell people, let's just say you're um, you're looking to be an MSL or you are, an, you are an MSL right now. Well, your photo should indicate that. So if you currently have a photo of yourself and you're in, in a cap and gown, you know what that tells me? That tells me you're a student. You look like a student. You don't look like an MSL. If you wanna be an MSL, get a professional headshot taken in a, in a professional attire, in, in a suit. If you're in a lab coat, you look like a clinician. Now, if you if you want to look like a cl clinician because that's what you do and that's what you want to do, and if that's the image you're looking to portray, that's totally fine. But if you're looking to be something else, try to portray yourself as that something else. That's that's an excellent advice. Um, I uh, I I have that problem a little bit, by the way, because in my case, I have two companies mm -hmm. in two completely different areas. One, of course, is you know, medical affair and pharma SaaS company. Yep. And the other company is a Web3 crypto business, completely different <laughs> persona, <laughs> style, et cetera, et cetera. So my online presence can be a little bit confusing 
because of that. Uh, I don't have quite the choice because I decided to do both in parallel. But someone early in their career, usually they have one persona, right. they have one uh, objective, they should probably. And so your advice is extremely a good one, I believe. Well, and, and you know, again, I, like there, there are certain things that, you know, I, like in certain, in a lot of situations, it's a judgment call, right? In your situation, you actually, I love your photo because you have the, the VR headset on. Because when I think of you, I think of Bruno, I think of the metaverse, right? So that that's the perfect image in my mind for you. But sometimes I see pictures, they like people have photos of them and their dog. Like that's, yes. that's for Facebook. That's not for LinkedIn. And for those of you guys that aren't watching on YouTube right now, Bruno just put his headset on. So <laughs> he's got his VR headset on. That's how I think of this guy. <laughs> and I'm leaving you, but I'm looking around me and I see a beautiful lake uh, in the my metaverse office through that big, big window in my metaverse office. So, uh... <laughs> Well, listen, guys, at some point in time, we're going to do this podcast completely in the metaverse. We're all going to be in the metaverse and we're going to do it that way. So it's a little premature for that. But Bruno, I want to thank you for coming on. Any last words for these guys? Oh, I, I love uh, joining uh, your podcast. And I think you have a wonderful community that you build uh, every year, every quarter, a little bit uh, stronger. And that's uh, a great inspiration for me, actually. So thank you. Awesome. And you know what? In the spirit of Bruno Larvel, I want to thank everybody that's listening in France. We have great listenership in France. So thank you all for listening. Hey, guys, have an awesome year. It's 2023. We're going to crush it. I believe in you guys. I know you're going to have an awesome year. So just want to wish you all the best. And Bruno, thank you so much for coming on. You're awesome, my friend. Thank you very much, Tom. Goodbye. Au revoir. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you've enjoyed it, please subscribe so that you don't miss episodes in the future and feel free to leave a rating or a review or a comment. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.